Hello, this is Chris Bennett. Join us week on TV on the Burning Shiva Hour as we explore the roots of cannabis culture throughout history and around the globe. Hi, this is Chris Bennett with the Burning Shiva Hour and today on POT TV we're honored to have a special guest, Professor of Classical Mythology at Boston University, Carl P. Ruck. Hi Carl, how are you doing today? Hi Chris. Yeah, um, uh, Professor Ruck, you've had, had the opportunity to uh, work with a, a number of well-known, uh, prominent individuals in the uh, entheogenic research field. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, how you got involved with this, who you've had a chance to work with, and a uh, bit of a background? Well, I, I worked with uh, Gordon Wasson, and through him I met Albert Hoffman and uh, Richard Schultes. Oh, wow. And, and so I'm, and all the big ones, I know. And actually, um, although a team of us uh, signed up for the, the, the term entheogen, mm -hmm. uh, I was the one, together with Blaise Staples, who's also a classicist, who came up with it. And so it's really our term, and we're very proud to find that people are using it. Um, I, I began by being uh, a typical classical scholar, but I felt that the sources of inspiration were not rational but irrational, and so I thought a good deal of the literature that I was studying didn't have a rational meaning, but had a kind of metaphysical, intuitive meaning. And uh, I was particularly interested in, in uh, the theater of Dionysus, and I know that people have put uh, rational meanings on the plays, but if you look at the situation of the performance of the plays, where you had so many plays produced one after another in, in a festival, and um, the, the, the play would not have an individual meaning. They'd have to have a thematic meaning. And so as an attempt to, um, to follow that idea, I started studying more about the religion of Dionysus and discovered that Greek wine, which was always drunk, diluted, highly diluted, but was very, very intoxicating, could not have been a simple alcoholic beverage, but was a mixture of alcohol with other things. So that uh, got me interested in drugs, or as we now call it, uh, entheogens. And I discovered in addition that during the performances of the drama, the people in the theater were drinking this potion, and it was a, a particular potion, had a name because of the things that were added to it. So the whole situation indicated that it was a, a kind of shamanic, joint shamanic um, communion, rather than the kind of thing that rational scholars have, have imposed upon it. So I had written something of that, uh, about that, and Blaze, my friend, uh, suggested that I contact Gordon Wasson, because he was such a great name, I was very reluctant, but um, I did. And almost immediately he phoned me and said he was coming to Cambridge and could we have lunch. And so we got to know each other very, very well. How, how long ago was that? Well. Uh, Gordon's been dead for 10 years. We published The, the Road to Alepsis in, in 78. I think it must have been about 73 that I hmm. first met him. Wow, that's qu quite a ways back. Yeah. Now, um, what kind of uh, substances are you uh, suggesting for the Dionysiac wine? What do you think that they were using in it? Well, I think they would use anything they could find. Mm -hmm. it's still, it still is the custom in country brews to add whatever you can to, uh, to doctor the wine. And in the situation of the Greek drinking party, the, it was very much more like a um, Japanese geisha party. I don't know if you know the custom is there, but the, your host challenges you with intoxication. And so you know that, I mean, you, you know that you're, you're up for it, you prepare by eating special things in advance, because you don't have the choice of not drinking or drinking abstemiously. You have to drink as much as is given, and um, you drink it down. And then, as in the, the Greek symposium, you're not supposed to show any sign of drunkenness, and so you play complicated word games and, and things of that kind. And uh, the uh, the master of, of the, the drinking party for the symposium chose what he was going to add. <laughs> hmm. And uh, any anything, I think, uh, was fair game. I, I know that you're particularly interested in marijuana, Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that certainly figured in Roman antiquity. Yeah, they and found Thracian wine in Canada. Why the Greeks seem to be so uninterested in it? Mm -hmm. But Herodotus's 
description of the Scythian steam bath, as, as he called it, seems to indicate that um, they, weren't, they weren't that interested in it, hmm. which would mean that they had other things that were equally good. And the same thing is true. The, the Greeks were aware of beer, but um, they only had an anthropological interest in beer. Their, their drink was wine. Hmm. But anything that was available, they would add to it. Well, it's kind of like the strong drink in the Bible there. That's the so-called strong drink. Yeah, there is no such thing as strong alcoholic drink without distillation. Hmm. And the ancients did not know about distillation. They didn't even know what alcohol was hmm. uh, as, as a substance. And so um, the strong alcoholic drink is strong because of the things that are added to it. Hmm. Do you see a similar substance at use in the uh, Eleusius Mysteries or... Uh, um See, and there, uh, we often uh, can fantasize that in, in antiquity anything went and that mm -hmm. drugs were not illegal. But uh, in the case of the Eleusinian mystery, quite clearly there was a drug involved, and the profane use of it was very illegal. You could be put to death for it. And the work I did with Wasson and, and, and Hoffman, we identified that the, uh, the toxin came from ergot. It uh, has to be separated from the other toxins in ergotized grain. But um, our, our original solution was that um, only the uh, psychoactive toxins are water-soluble, because if you don't separate them, you suffer from the effects of ergotism, mm -hmm. which can be fatal. See, but the um, psychotropic ones are water-soluble. That was our original theory, and people have tried the potion, and uh, Jonathan Ott tried it over and over again, and it doesn't seem to work, even though the chemistry is correct. Hmm. You, you can't access um, uh, psychoactive uh, toxins. But we're very naive in, in our understanding of, of how complex and knowledgeable ancient herbalism would be. And so we've refined the, uh, um, the idea paper with um, Daniel Perrine and, and uh, Peter Webster, if you have a alkaline solution, the um, water-soluble toxins, which are the psychoactive ones, are more soluble. And so that's been proposed. Um, but I, even, even so, we may still be um, too naive. For, for example, the, uh, in the death of Socrates, um, he's given a drink of hemlock, and descriptions that I, in contemporary literature that, that I found of death by hemlock are absolutely horrible. Your stomach bloats up and you, and, and you explode. And yet, um, in the death, death of Socrates, as described by Plato, it's a, a very, very slow uh, cooling of the, uh, of the extremities rising up until it hits the heart. But at, at, as he's taking the potion, Socrates says, is it all right if I pour out a bit as a libation to the gods? And the attendant says, no, this is the right potion, the right amount. You have to drink the whole thing. So it does seem to indicate that they knew how to control and, and modify the effects by uh, addition of, of various other substances. Until the Dark Ages came along and wiped out all that wiped knowledge. Wiped out all that knowledge, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, like, I guess, it, uh, what's your feeling? Is, the, is the, role, the history of religion and the role of entheogens pretty inseparable? Like, you see that in pretty much a, every major religion, a role for some sort of entheogenic substance? Yeah, um, I, we're not probably the first ones to propose it, but the last book that I wrote with Wasson, uh, Persephone's Quest, I read that entheogens one. and the origins of religion were making a strong statement there that uh, the entheogenic experience is, in fact, uh, the origin of religious experience. And other people have proposed it and are now going along with that idea also. Hmm. But I don't think we were the first to, uh, to say that. And uh, um, being from the West in, uh, in a culture deeply influenced by the Bible, and the Bible generally thought to be the uh, pious book of sobriety, what role do you see uh, for entheogens in the whole biblical storyline from the Garden of Eden to the Book of Revelation? Well, as you know, I've been reading your book, um, and I'm, I'm greatly impressed by it. And you've totally convinced me that uh, cannabis had a role in the, in the uh, Jewish temple. Well, that's an honor to... Early, uh, early Judaism and probably passed on into Christ Christianity. Um, I've also written other things along the... It's interesting how your work has been 
paralleling mine, although I only um, got to know your book about a month or so ago when you, you sent me the copy of it. But we are essentially in agreement about uh, everything, mm. except that I doubt that cannabis is strong enough to produce the visionary experience of, um, of an intense mystery initiation. I think other things were, were involved. We've been working recently on Mithras, Mithraism, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, seven stages of graded initiation for the final revelation. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that probably the uh, chamber was always fumigated with incense mm -hmm. and that cannabis was part of it, and so that the whole experience was colored by that heightened um, sta uh, state of mind. But probably in order to um, to produce the uh, the ultimate revelation, you needed some other entheogen. Yeah, I, I would I agree with you mostly with what you're saying, but um, I believe there's some ingestible uh, forms of cannabis that that are quite powerful uh, uh, entheogenic substances, and there's uh, different records of this. You, Andrew Wheel uh, has a description of a cannabis overdose that's very very. Uh, He's like reliving stuff from when he was a kid, and said it seemed like he was right yeah, there. Yeah, it can it can be very yeah. intense. Yeah, uh, um, but um, I also agree that, like, particularly in the Mithraic, which is very similar to the Gnostic seven stage initiations, that it does seem that uh, a number of such substances were used, and cannabis was one of them. Much like Maztec shamans start, start with mm -hmm. salvia divinorum and then move on to the mushrooms, mm -hmm. that uh, different substances. Uh, um, were associated with the different uh, planetary spheres and, uh, and ascension through them in, in both uh, Mithraic and in uh, Gnostic uh, documents. Yes, yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's definitely, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, what, what do you think the end goal, like what, what, what was the experience they were looking at? Do you think it was a collective experience, not necessarily shared collectively, but a collectively identifiable uh, psychic state perhaps or something? Yes. Yes, it, it was to experience the um, the event of death and rebirth before it, before you die, mm -hmm. so that when it happens, it's a familiar experience. And you're prepared to just pass yeah. on to that next level. That's fascinating. Um, and the, and your feelings on the uh, soma. You know, I know that that was a big uh, a theory of Wasson's. Do you identify that solely with the fly agaric or like the uh, Greek wines, perhaps uh, a combination of different substances? Well, I've been um, very much influenced by, by Gordon's work and trying to um, you know, follow where it goes. And um, I think very often you have the uh, symbolism of the fly agaric mm -hmm. that other uh, substances are, are being used. Most recently, we've been in because flying garrick is difficult to find and in some ways, for some people at least, a very unpleasant experience, um, not to totally dependable. And we've been looking at how um, the flying garrick symbolism got transferred probably to an ergot drink, hmm. which became probably the ingredient of, of beer. Uh, do you know Tom Relinger's paper on, on Egyptian beer? No, I haven't read it, that. Well, Egyptian beer is made in, was made in a very strange process. Um, instead of just fermenting the, the grain, it was made from fermented grain um, and from bread that was soaked in water. And he argues that ergotized bread, bread made from ergotized grain, if you soak it, you would get the psychoactive toxin from it. Hmm. And if you add that to the alcoholic ferment, you see, you, you can't, you can't uh, use ergotized grain, uh, grain for uh, fermentation because the toxic chemicals are uh, soluble in alcohol, hmm. not, not in water. And so th it's very strange. The, the archaeologists say, well, it was a, apparently a very um, inefficient and weak kind of, uh, of uh, beer. It, strangely, it was very intoxicating, and they used it for ritual intoxication. I mean, they, they don't know what they're saying. It obviously um, uh, had its intoxicating quality, not primarily from the alcohol, but from some other source. And Riedlinger's idea is that it comes from the um, soluble toxins mm -hmm. in the ergot. Otherwise, why would they make it that way? And this is 
particularly interesting. Um, well, well, one of the things we've, we've been working on, um, King Midas with the Golden Touch, even though he's a legendary figure, he really existed. And his, uh, his uh, funeral remains have, have been dug up by archaeologists. And for his funeral, they had a, a funeral banquet. And uh, for some reason, um, we know why, because it was a sacred banquet. The utensils for the banquet were buried with the king. And there's a residue of what they drank. Now, the whole, everyone, um, we think that the funeral banquet was, uh, King Midas in his mythical tradition is very much involved with journeys to the Hyperboreans, which means out-of-body experience, travel, uh, traveling as a shaman, things mm -hmm. of that kind. Wasn't hyperburning a, a term for like shamans from the Scythian culture? Yes, or? exactly. Yeah. And we think that the, um, the funeral guests uh, all took a journey in the soul with the king to, the, to his final resting place. Hmm, and so that um, the, the drink was psychoactive. The archaeologists have, have um, analyzed the residue and discovered that it was a barley drink with, with honey. But since they're not aware of or interested in possible entheogenic additives, they've done no testing for ergot. Hmm. We've been trying to get access uh, to the, the residue to, to test more sophisticatedly for that sort of thing. But it's strange. Um, you almost get people interested, and then they shy away from it because uh, the attitude of, of our country towards drugs is so adverse that you might lose your academic respectability if you discovered that King Midas had an, an Aragot drink for his, for his funeral. It's like the but, study of um, sex and religion a century I, ago. I, I, I suspect that um, European culture finds often, uh, even though there's this, for the fly garrick Amanita muscaria, that they find the eating of mushrooms somehow strange. But they would find nothing wrong with the drinking of a special beer. And I think the tradition passed on into Europe primarily as, uh, as fortified beers. Hmm. And, and beer is the same situation as wine. There's no reason why they wouldn't add anything to it to make it stronger. Hmm. Well then, uh, how about in places like Ireland? And then I know that uh, Peter Lamborn Wilson is speculating on an Irish soma. Do you see the Irish soma as something along this type of line as well, or? Well, I think probably both were going on because the the um, symbolic characteristics of the fly garrick are so strongly in, embedded in, in the folklore tradition. Um, but I think it, it's quite possible that. Um, well, I mean, the point of it was to have the experience, and anything that was going to do it most um, feasibly would, would be used. Hmm. And um, what I, mean, I know that you've been interested in Freemasonry and things of that kind. Yeah. And and in alchemy as well. And I, I suspect that um, Freemasons would have shied away from uh, from um, eating fly agaric, but they'd have. But we know that that um, they were reviving the Egyptian mysteries. What do they mean by that? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, uh, um, uh, something I've been reading on both uh, positive and negative uh, sites about the Illuminati was that their original slogan was Uj Blumenkraft, the eternal flower power. Mm -hmm. And uh, both sites state that uh, illumination was produced by a combination of meditation and hashish intoxication. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, it's pretty hard to... Uh, document something like that, but we do know that one of the original founders of the Illuminati, Jan Potocki, uh, wrote uh, the Saragossa Manuscript, which is uh, stories within stories, much like A Thousand One Nights, mm -hmm. but the main character is uh, stoned on hashish, and you can't tell if, if what's happening is really happening or if it's a, a product of hashish intoxication. Now, these complicated uh, alchemical manuscripts, which in some senses uh, seem to describe actual chemical processes and which in other instances seem to describe processes with inside the individual. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, do you see these as actual potential references to chemical preparations of entheogens or extractions and uh, or anything like that? Yes, probably. probably. But um, I think that the medieval Renaissance mind acted quite differently from ours. And so that by manipulating things in the test tube, they were also manipulating spiritual processes within themselves. So I don't think it, it was all just a matter of 
of chemistry and trying to find uh, the drink that was going to produce uh, the experience. Um, I, I think the easiest way to understand the difference is that we would tend to say, I ate something and saw God. And the early Christian mystics say, I saw God and he gave me something to eat. Hmm. That's an interesting uh, parallel. Um, the, uh, prior to Alchemy too, I'm just going to step back here a little bit between uh, religions. Um, at the fall of Christianity, well, not like the fall of Christianity, but at the rise of the Dark Ages, the, the rise of the Roman Catholic Church, do you see that as uh, an instance that was uh, very much focused on the suppression of antheogenic knowledge? Yes, because the, the whole uh, emphasis of the Roman Church, Roman Catholic Church, was that it had to control access to God. And um, th th this is still the prejudice of, of, mm -hmm. of the Church. The even though the Christian mystics were doing it individually, you're not supposed to contact God except through the Church. And so it, it's a political structure that they've imposed between the devotee and the deity. Hmm. What uh, entheogenic roles do you think that the early Christians were using? Uh, what substances do you think that they may have been using for the first few centuries prior to the Dark Ages? Well, we've always been interested in the mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And um, in Apples of Apollo, um, following uh, uh, Fabro, I guess his name is, um, who published it in the journal Eleusis, there's a basilica in northern Italy, 4th uh, century, so it's very early Christian. And um, it's built on top of an earlier Christian sanctuary. I mean, the original one was 4th century. And um, when they built the, the new church on top of it, they just left the, the floor of the old ch church underneath it. And um, archaeologists have uncovered that it was a mosaic floor. And the, the, the design of the floor has baskets of mushrooms, probably Amanita muscaria. Hmm. Now, this was not a restaurant. This was an agape hall, an early Christian meeting place. Love feast. And so you're not decorating it with the favorite food of the Romans. You're decorating it with the sacrament. Fascinating. Now, do you see certain uh, early Christian sects using these substances and certain ones not using them? Anything like that, like the Gnostic sects and the Catholic sects maybe not? Or do you think that the Catholics were aware of it and they suppressed it? I think that the, the Roman Church was aware of it and suppressed it, but that it continually... Uh, was reintroduced by contact with the, with the East, especially under the Crusaders, and that they never they never uh, got uh, stamped it out, especially since the sacrament of early Christianity was probably very similar to the sacrament of Mithraism, and Mithraism was supposedly um, eradicated when Constantine converted to Christianity, but it never stopped, and. Um, one of the essays in, in, in the next issue of um, Encias, uh, written by um, a, a Spanish colleague, Jose Alfredo uh, Gonzalez Celdron, they have very long names, <laughs> and you have to use them all, but um, it's a postscript to the main essay on, on Mithras, and he uncovered uh, in 10th century uh, Avila, uh, where St. Teresa comes, uh, came from, that on the uh, cathedral, over the portal in a very significant context of the earthly banquet and the heavenly banquet, uh, Lazarus, but not the one who's resurrected from the dead, but the other one um, who's denied uh, anything to eat at the rich man's banquet. And then when he gets, after they die, Lazarus is in heaven and the rich man's in hell. Um, so it has very much to do with the sacred banquet. And right in the middle between the two panels over the, the portal, is something that can only be a mushroom and probably fly Garrick. I mean, he he's he, he asked the priest, "What what is that up there?" He said, "I don't. It's a mushroom, but I don't know what it's doing there." Hmm, fascinating. And and um, the, the reason this is a postscript to Mithras is that in the church is laid to rest a bishop, and the symbolism of his tomb is Mithraic, and showing him being born from the pine cone rock the way Mithras is supposed to have been born or regenerated. 
Um, one of the more popular Gnostic teachers, Manny, uh, um, was also a worshipper of Zoroaster along with Jesus and Buddha. I would imagine that, that some Mithraic uh, influence must have come into Christianity through uh, Manny and... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, yes. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the Manicheans were accused of eating the red mushroom, too. Yes, they loved mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. And it, 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 it has to do with the whole ethnobotany of, of uh, Manichaean mm -hmm. religion, hmm. which is that the, the spirit is encased in matter, and you try to liberate the spirit from this curse of being encased in matter. Unfortunately, you have to eat things. And um, the, uh, when um, animals and plants were created, special circumstance in the creation of plants is that they have less spirit in them. And, um, and so they were vegetarians. And amongst the, the vegetables, the plant that had the least spirit encased in it, because they couldn't figure out how to reproduce, was the mushroom. Mm -hmm. So the mushroom diet was the best vegetarian diet to release the body from its, its uh, imprisonment and uh, the soul from its imprisonment in the body. Hmm. Now, uh, um, the Catholic Church seemed uh, extremely worried about the infiltration of their uh, numbers by Manicheans. Do you see these frescoes and whatnot that depict the, the uh, uh, fly agaric or potentially pick the fly agaric as uh, possible Manichean uh, uh, initiates uh, um, infiltrating the church and managing to leave us little uh, hieroglyphs of their... Uh, uh, own views? Yeah, probably. But I don't think they were trying to leave us a sign. I, I think that it has to do with this basic controversy. That can the church stand in the way of your direct contact with God? Do you have to contact God through the church? Or can you contact God individually? Hmm. And um, the desire to have this mystical union uh, with the divine personally is so strong that people are going to break the bond, uh, uh, the, the bonds all the time. The, the church was never, f well, maybe eventually fully successful, but weren't so successful in completely uh, um, silencing the Manicheans, and uh, um, they went into China and uh, into Europe through the Cathars and yes, stuff. Yes, they were still in China in the 17th century. Wow, I've heard that Mantak Chia's whole uh, sexual tantric type knowledge comes from... Uh, yeah from Manichaean sources. And do you see uh, references to uh, entheogenic use continuing in China and continuing in southern France and Europe amongst the Albigenese, Cathar type? Yes, quite definitely. Hmm, fascinating. And uh, um, as far as secret societies that have used these substances, I don't know if you've uh, heard about Shakespeare's pipes. I had the opportunity yes, to get. Yes, I, I know. We were, that's what we were hoping to um, replicate in, in, in investigating the residue of King Midas. Yeah, yeah, funeral. it reminded me of that. But yeah. we haven't managed to get access yet. Yeah, it's difficult. That's that's the hard part. You know, I, I, as I was saying earlier, it's almost like trying to study the role of sex in religion a century yeah. ago. It's like, oh, we can't talk about that. And yeah. since it never gets talked about, it's never well, it's really taken serious. It's destructive testing. In order to test for what's in, in it, you are going to destroy the sample. And since it is a piece of human history. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to convince people that you can destroy it in order to discover something. Okay. Although you only need a little bit. And huh. it, re it really is a prejudice against discovering that sort of thing. The, the, the whole uh, use of the anthrogens in the medieval times, do you think this was something that was done, like it had to be done to hide from the church in a sense, that, that, that they couldn't really be very open about what they were doing? Yes, yes. Do you uh, see any sort of tradition from that time period carrying on to the modern day? Well, how do you mean? Uh, I, I, I've um, via like Dan Freemasons or Rosicrucians or something like that, I suppose. We've, um, you know, Dan DeCour wrote the Mana Psychedelic Sacrament of, of the Bible, and we've discussed just how far you can trace these entheogenic. Um, initiations, and he feels he can go as far as the, the 19th century, probably further, but he's afraid to. And I had an informant in Greece who was very excited about what I was doing, high, high placed in, in the government, 
and he wanted to tell me things. Um, but then he got frightened, and um, so he's broken off all communication with me. Fascinating. I've heard R. Gordon Watson was a Freemason. Do you know anything about that? Um, he never mentioned it to me. I, I, I spoke to Mark Hoffman, who's gone through the Watson archives, and there's nothing in it that he knows that mentions it. But it would be totally the sort of thing he would do if for no other reason than for business purposes. Hmm. I mean, it, it would be the, the sort of thing a man of his background could have done. But he never mentioned it. Hmm. But of course, he would have been sw sworn to secrecy. Yeah, but he yeah. Wouldn't be. Yeah, Alistair Crowley, one guy I've looked at for like entheogenic uh, references, mentions in a uh, psychology of hashish and elsewhere that he can only say so much because of his uh, association with these uh, associations. Yeah. Um, so that kind of Gordon limits used it. To say he had taken drugs, but only in countries where it was legal. There you go. Uh, um, yeah, well, it's for me, it's kind of the opposite of Merker, whereas like I'm, I've been chasing it back, and I can kind of find it to the 19th century. But uh, trying to attach a tradition from the 19th century to a further older medieval tradition, there was just so many uh, Freemason groups and Neo-Freemason and Neo-Rosicrucian yeah. groups that arose during that period. It's hard to tell exactly uh, where one starts, you know, and where, where, whether it's continuing on from something yeah. older. Sure. Uh, um, now, as far as like uh, with, with America being uh, near the, the, the boiling point on uh, the war on drugs and stuff like that, what role do you see in the future for scholars such as yourself that uh, study these substances and uh, indeed for the antheogens themselves? Well, I think that there's sort of a benign neglect for us. Um, we can say what we want and it doesn't influence anyone. I think the real change is, is, is happening with Europe's attitude. Um, Europe has been forced into America's war on drugs and it's so obvious that it's a war that can't be won so Europe is disassociating itself with America. I mean, England just recently decriminalized marijuana. Um, and I know someone who's working with the European Parliament. Um, and all of Europe may well follow that lead. Fascinating. Yeah, there's lots of movement that way here in Canada as well. And uh, hopefully being so close to America, we can... Uh, lend a little bit of a nudge to the the, the great the mouse can push the elephant a little bit and uh, mm -hmm. um, we can sway it the the other way i mean i mean drugs are dangerous but the the real danger is to prohibit mm -hmm. and um the way to handle it is to the, the way alcohol is handled it's given a, a positive meaning it can be very dangerous it can be addictive but it also can have a social role and uh you, 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 you use the experience instead of prohibiting it. Hmm. On that note, if you were to see like some sort of uh, spiritual-based uh, reintroduction of substances into society, would you uh, model it after any certain group that you've had a chance to study? Well, it, 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 it already is happening. I mean, for 100 years there's been a Brazilian cult with branches all over the United States, the Santo Daime use an ayahuasca sacrament, and the government hasn't managed to ban that, and the Native American church has a peyote sacrament. The problem is that um, the government doesn't feel that you could convert to the Native American church, mm -hmm. because it's an ethnic church. But that argument doesn't, doesn't hold any water, because you can convert to Judaism, which is definitely an ethnic religion. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's simply a matter of trying to keep people from uh, having access to the experience. Why do you think that is? Well, it's, it goes back to the, the, the early Roman church. They want to control mm -hmm. you. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's been a, a great pleasure and honor to speak to you, Professor Rock, and uh, hopefully... Hey, Chris, nice talking to you. Yeah, and hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss some things again.